I wonder what Elijah was thinking when he sat alone in his cold, rocky cave. One man of God, once fully empowered to do miracles, but now in despair, fully isolated from the presence of God, not to mention separated from all other worshipers. Am I all alone? Where are your people, Lord? Is there no one else who even cares about your covenant? We call down fire from heaven, Lord, and still no one is with me. I'm all alone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I've had enough, Lord. I already told you, just take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who've already died. Elijah's legs were starting to cramp. He had to get out of here. But where would he go? Just as he was beginning to rise, he heard the voice. That voice. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came, and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint new kings for Aram and Israel, and then anoint Elisha, to replace you as my prophet. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. What Elijah had forgotten was that God always preserves a remnant and he never desires for worshipers to be alone. Many generations earlier in Egypt, the children of Israel also had lost all hope. There was no one to save them. They were great in number because God had multiplied them through childbirth, but they were trapped. Generations of captivity. No hope. But the Lord preserved one Hebrew. A man who would escape slavery. A man who from birth would have his mind filled with politics and policies and administering justice over thousands upon thousands of people. A man whose mind would be filled with the higher things of palaces, not mired in brick-making and servitude. Moses was the remnant, preserved by God deep in Pharaoh's house, raised by kings himself trained in the ways of the kingdom. And yet, after killing a man in a fit of righteous zeal, he found himself fleeing for his life. He too was alone in the wilderness for a season. He would worship the God of his fathers with his small household. But he longed for the day when he could worship with all of his brothers and sisters. And then that day finally came. He no longer had to worship alone. The people of Israel, hundreds of thousands of them, had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel. Moses, Aaron, Miriam, Joshua, and the rest of the children of Israel were reunited and free. They were finally free to worship together in one accord. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God, and I will praise him my father's God, and I will exalt him. Oh, imagine what it would have been like to be there on that great day, to dance and spin 
and shout for joy as Miriam and the women led hundreds of thousands of people in worship and thanksgiving to the Lord Most High. Forty years later, the people gathered at the Jordan River. They were finally ready to claim the land that God had promised them. But 40 years in the wilderness, that changes you. Those original slaves turned worshipers of the Red Sea, they'd mostly died off. Joshua, Caleb, and the children who were born into freedom crossed over. This remnant was hardened. They were seasoned and stripped down by wind and heat and hard travel. A slow and patient act purging them of the harshest memories of Egypt. This generation, they had known hard days and nights that accompany life in the wilderness, but they only knew stories of slavery. They were born into freedom. And now, they were about to take back the land that God had promised to Abraham generations earlier, starting with the stronghold city of Jericho. Can you even imagine the shock on their faces? The sheer amazement when the great wall of Jericho fell? The Lord had said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all of its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you're to march around the town seven times with the priest blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horn, have all the people shout as loud as they can. And then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. And it happened. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. Can you imagine their amazement when the wall fell? It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. God delights in worship from his people and he works wonders to make a way for those worshipers. It was in David's heart to worship since he was a youth. David worshiped alone in the fields with his sheep. He worshiped in the face of an angry king who wanted to take his life. He worshiped alone in caves while he was living as a refugee. That same passion for singing praises to his God, it wasn't quenched in the presence of thousands of people. As king, David led a procession of worshipers rejoicing to return the Ark of the Covenant to Israel in out of the hands of unbelieving foreigners. David and all the people of Israel, they were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments. Lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. What a standard of worship from the king. No, from a shepherd boy. How amazing that you and I are free to worship the Lord in public just as you worship the Lord in private. Not just with your eyes closed and your hands raised in our own world of praise, but with leaping and dancing for all to see. But that freedom comes with a price. The price of freedom for an entire community to worship, it's astounding. That freedom was wrenched from the hands of Pharaoh. It required overthrowing the stronghold of Jericho. David fought for that freedom too. 
so much so that the Lord wouldn't allow him to finish the construction of the temple. His hands were too covered in blood. Hezekiah and Josiah also worshipped boldly. But like their predecessors, they weren't gifted freedom of community worship. They didn't inherit an entire nation that desired to praise God Most High. Hezekiah also had to fight for his worship. And he wasn't happy to just make a way to freely worship alone. Nor just among his family and friends. Not even in the warm confines of a congregation. No, Hezekiah was fighting for the freedom to worship with an entire nation. He fought to cleanse the temple after his ancestors were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They abandoned the Lord and his dwelling place. They turned their backs on him. So Hezekiah fixed the problem. He cleaned the temple and rededicated it. He reinstated Passover celebration. He restored worship in Israel, not just private worship in homes and synagogues, but he fought for national worship. He took worship out of the safety of closed doors and back into the streets. Josiah did the same thing. He didn't just sit back in safety, complaining about the state of his nation. He hit the streets. He went to work. He used his authority to demolish all the buildings at the pagan shrines in the towns of Samaria, just as he had done at Bethel. He utilized the full force of his power as king. Only then did he return to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover with all the people. What a time of revival that had to be. The scripture says, never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart, soul, and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses. And there has never been a king like him since. Josiah fought for worship, and when he did, the people followed his lead. Need we say more? In order for the community of God to worship together freely and boldly, in one accord, a great cost must be paid. Worship is warfare. Worship is escaping from slavery. It's claiming territory that the enemy has overrun. Worship is reestablishing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Do you want more examples? What about Nehemiah? The city of Jerusalem was run down, worn out, and worshipers were few and far between. Nehemiah partnered with God and took action. The work to restore the city was hard, but the result was amazing. For the dedication of the new wall of Jerusalem, the Levites throughout the land were asked to come to Jerusalem to assist in the ceremonies. They were to take part in the joyous occasion with their songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. For the singers had built their own settlements around Jerusalem. Did you catch that? The singers built settlements around Jerusalem. That's worship warfare. Yeshua made a declaration about worship. He said the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain in Samaria or in Jerusalem. The time is coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Our Lord is looking for those who will worship Him that way. What way? I wonder if He meant worshiping God with reckless abandon. 
whether on the sacred mountain or the secular one. I wonder if he meant God is looking for worshipers who will take their worship outside of the safety of their comfortable, established places. I wonder if he meant not just pressing the limits of a comfort zone in personal worship, though that is good, but boldly worshiping God outside of the established place of worship altogether. How many times have we been embarrassed just to be seen worshiping in our car with the windows up or caught singing out loud in public when we have our headphones on? I bet Joshua would have rather worshiped in a safe place too. But that wasn't his calling, and it's not ours. Would we be like David? Not just leaping and dancing in synagogue, but leaping and dancing on the public streets, in the mall, at work. Would we be like Hezekiah, Josiah, Nehemiah, Ezra, and the many other heroes of our faith who rallied the men and women, stood up to their opposition, and took their worship into the public domain? This is the essence of community worship, getting out of our safe spaces and worshiping with as many other worshipers as will join us. I wonder if our friend Elijah got so downtrodden because in a moment of weakness, he fled and sought isolation rather than seeking out other worshipers. When the fire of God fell, he felt the power of the Lord. But nonetheless, he listened to the lies of the enemy that he was the only worshiper left. I don't know what Yeshua was talking about when he met with Elijah and Moses up on a high mountain. Maybe they were talking about worship. I doubt they were reminiscing about old times. Maybe they were talking about the next wave of worshipers. Maybe they were discussing how times were about to change and worshipers would be sent out of Jerusalem into the four corners of the earth. Maybe they were talking about the word given to Isaiah, that earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That scale of community worship, it won't happen if those of us who praise God only do so from the confines of our safe places. God is looking for any time and everywhere worshipers, not just closed door worshipers, but those who will get out in the streets and proclaim the knowledge of the glory of the Lord to anyone and everyone and everything. In John's revelation, he also declares the final state of worship. He says, then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. How amazing that would be to see today and not just in the future. Myriads of worshipers out in the open, declaring to the heavens and the earth that the kingdom of God is here among us and Yeshua is Lord.